Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. There, there are still some people out there. This is going to be a fabulous session. I, I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the, the first part of the morning as much as I did. And this now is going to be uh, something uh, that I think you really will enjoy. Uh, this is a session on atrial fibrillation. Uh, we haven't had one of these uh, at this meeting for four or five years, I think. And this is a subject that I think is grossly overlooked uh, by surgeons and uh, an area where we definitely need to have a raised level of awareness and education. Now, um, Ralph Damiano, whose name is up there, uh, was to be one of the speakers, but unfortunately he, uh, uh, he could not make it because of travel issues and he was stuck in Atlanta last night and has called to apologize. Uh, Niv Ad and Steve Hoff uh, will, be, uh, will be delivering the talks and Niv will moderate the session. Niv needs no introduction. He is, uh, I think, the preeminent surgeon uh, in the world today in this area of atrial fibrillation, certainly one of three or four, uh, less than a handful. Uh, Steve Hoff has also made a name for himself in this, in this area, and I'm very, very pleased uh, to, uh, to, uh, to have them both over here and very grateful to them. Uh, Niv will be giving Ralph's talk, um, and then we'll take it from there. So, Niv. Good morning and thank you, Mayesh. Uh, when Mayesh asked me to uh, uh, try to put together an AF session uh, in his meeting, uh, I was very pleased and one of the plans was to bring Ralph to talk about uh, an area that's it's really important, which is uh, ablation technologies for atrial fibrillation and, and how do we decide or what to use and, wh and why. And um, recently I'm uh, very obsessed with decision making and decision making process and actually going to come out with some, I, I believe, some interesting uh, aspects of it. But I want to read you something from uh, what's considered to be a very smart man, uh, Daniel Kahneman, who is uh, actually known to be uh, the Nobel Prize winner for uh, economy, but is uh, uh, also a well-known psychologist. And he said something that I will read, uh, which would say, we think, each of us, that we are much more rational than we are. And we think that we make our decisions because we have good reasons to make them, even when it's the other way around. We believe in the reasons because we've already made a decision. And I think uh, this fits uh, very, very well to what I personally hear for many, many, many years uh, around the, the field of atrial fibrillation. And um, I'm often being perceived as too critical uh, about innovations and other, anything other than the full maze procedure. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, when, as a young person, when you start to uh, perform operation by yourself and decide about your career, you have to make a few important decisions. And um, I always go back to a sentence I read in the, in the Sabitstone group, uh, book, textbook, uh, when Floyd Loop wrote, Floyd Loop wrote the, 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 the chapter on uh, redo uh, cabbage operation. And it starts with, you need more than a good reason to reoperate on a patient with a patent lima to the LAD. So with that being said, uh, you know, everything I know and do with AFib surgery is based on what I was learned from Jimmy Cox. And Jimmy Cox told me that you actually need more than a good reason to move away from the cut and sew maze procedure to the cryo, which was done while I was his fellow, and, and, and move on. But we have to understand also the fact that the field may not be moved forward as, as much as we want it to move because it's being perceived maybe as too confused, too aggressive, underperformed, all of the above, et cetera, et cetera. So while we push progress, we have to understand the principles of what works and not what, and what not. And we think it's very important to start with technologies because not everything we hold in our hands work and not necessarily what we use in our work that may work in some hands and not in others uh, is, is utilized the right way. And the best example for it is actually a failed trial for IDE uh, by Medtronic, the QAF. 
And what's interesting in the study is that if you look at the results from the centers, the results with the same technology, with the same lesion set, were zero to 100% success rate. So what it tells us that the devil is in the details, especially when it comes to AFib. The other point that I want to make, which is really important before I start the talk, AFib, unlike coronary bypass, unlike valvular heart disease, unlike anything else, even at the end of the, of the in interventional cardiologist or the EP, it is still an out, meaning there, is a, there are variations between an operator to an operator. You can put a stent in a coronary and it doesn't matter who puts the stent. And that's what we are up against, technique versus technology. And it's 100% of the time we're going to lose when it comes to technique versus technology. But when it comes to AFib, the technique is still important and the technology is somewhat a tool to perfect the technique. This is the way I look at it. And this is why we see those variations between operators, even in the, in the EP world. So uh, let's start with uh, uh, Ralph talk. I, I hope I got it only this morning. So I hope I'll do a good job as he, uh, he, he, that he would approve because he's, he's really the world expert when it comes to technologies and he tested all of them uh, in, 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 in his lab. And Matt, if I'm, uh, Matt Shear is here, is the research fellow, raise your hand. He's a research fellow in uh, 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 Ralph's lab, and uh, if you have anything to add, just please raise your hand and, uh, okay, and help me out. So uh, basically, um, what's the most important goal of a surgical ablation device? Uh, first, you have to have consistently uh, transmural and continuous lesions. So you have to be consistent 100% of the time. And uh, the lab from in St. Louis showed, uh, like other uh, EP showed before, that all you need is a very small gap to con reconduct. Very small gap, a millimeter, and there are works actually with, in the EP world that even a less than a millimeter is enough to conduct. So the original surgical ablation device is basically the cut and sew maze or the cut and sew uh, left atrial isolation or uh, uh, the, the cut and sew uh, left atrial transection, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so you cut and sew, so you have no question you divided all the fibers. Um, but there are questions whether reconduction across those lines can occur, and there are some anecdotal reports that uh, show this. But even with the cut and sew maze procedure, there were cryo lesions, basically to complete the AV groove lesions, and, and we may talk about it later. So this is how it looks. Um, a weave of uh, uh, um, lesions uh, across the left and the right atrium from the back, there's IVC, SVC, four pulmonary veins. So the basis of it is pulmonary vein isolation as a, as a box. Uh, going to the, towards the uh, uh, base of the left atrial appendage, and appendectomy in the both of them, and then the right atrial lesion. And the excess represent a cryo lesion, actually. Now, what you see here is actually a lesion that I think I'm the only one still doing it, and everybody that was in my operating room and saw it and taught, uh, learned it from me is doing it, is the septal lesion. Because if you look at the theoretical aspects of the maze procedure um, uh, for failure, this is one of the areas that you might have a failure, and we may talk about it uh, more. But in the original maze procedure, this lesion was not, or this cut was not made on any basis of uh, uh, findings, but more uh, to uh, enhance exposure. And these are the results as published back in uh, 2003. Um, uh, <clears throat> which uh, can, kind of uh, very uh, um, uh, impressive, 96% in sinus rhythm, 80% if you take only off medication, and AF 4%. But this study is criticized because um, we are not using modern tools for, uh, uh, for tracing AF, such as uh, halters, 
and uh, event monitors. But I always say this study is very important because when Carpentier came with his results on mitral valve repair, uh, nobody said, oh, you didn't repair the valve because you can't show echo on all of them in long term. So I think it's an evolution in the way we look and the way we define success and failure, and we have to keep everything in perspective. And, and we'll talk about it maybe in the second half of the talk um, um, that we will, uh, uh, I hope, we'll generate some questions afterwards. So only several hundred uh, may, cut, and may, cut and saw maze procedure, but uh, technology happened and uh, helped us to perform it quicker. Uh, uh, more efficiently, and basically thousands of patients since then were ablated uh, uh, successfully or not. Uh, so the advances in the last decade can be uh, defined into um, uh, ablation technology to replace the surgical cut and sew maze procedure, and by so doing, we can have a less invasive surgical approaches. So there are multiple devices that were introduced over the years and multiple devices the left. Uh, so you have the bipolar clamps here. These, these are the old atric uh, the, uh, the cardio ablate system, cryo uh, ablation with, uh, um, uh, this is a metronic today. And then in the middle you see the laser, microwave, uh, and the uh, high food device. And those are all out. So what's left to us today is a unipolar RF, which is the original Cobra here, but I'm talking about the, the family of it, cryoablation and bipolar ablation that we think worth uh, the discussion. So how you test the efficacy of the devices? You basically uh, 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 go and, 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 and uh, over uh, certain parameters, and we go over some of those graphs. But the FDA basically defined uh, most of those devices in the U.S. as uh, appropriate for soft tissue ablation, with the exception of the cryo devices, both by Metronic and atric that are defined for uh, indication for any cardiac arrhythmia. Um, and, and then um, <clears throat> basically because of, of soft tissue ablation and a very soft uh, definition, we got this um, kind of jungle of devices that uh, we don't know what exactly they do, but they can ablate tissue, but to what end? And uh, in the lab in, in St. Louis, they have the uh, long-standing uh, grant, and they basically uh, go over uh, all devices available and, and, and try to uh, validate them. So, um, we know that the challenge with ablation devices is the variability between patients and the variability within the cavity that you are ablating and when it comes to the amount of epicardial fat and tissue thickness. And also, when you do beating heart surgery, the heat sink effect is important uh, as it carries uh, uh, or mitigates the, the, the influence of, of the ablation warm or cold uh, when it comes uh, you know, epicardially. So uh, variability over uh, arterial wall thickness can go put between less than one millimeter in the thinner areas to more than two centimeters in the thicker area. And as you can see here, most of you uh, are familiar with all of it, but the lateral reach, for instance, is very thick, and, and the area of, of the, the coronary sinus and the fold are, are very thick as well. And as you can see here with, with illumination, some areas are very thin and some areas are very thick. But some areas are also trabeculated and some areas are not so trabeculated and that goes even, make it even more importantly when it comes to the right atrium. And the right atrium is the most abused one when it comes to ablation, especially epicardial ablation and other aspects of ablation. And I'll talk about, about it in, in, in terms of, of uh, what data that we really have is pacemakers, but uh, also uh, uh, the potential harm while ablating incomplete lesions on the right atrium, especially because of the, of the, of the trabeculation and, and the, and the three-dimensional aspects of the way it looks, of creating lesions that are incomplete and basically serve as a nidus for their next arrhythmia. 
And it's interesting when you follow even in my short career, so to speak, on inatrial fibrillation, when you follow the mode of failure of today as opposed to what it was even 10 years ago, 10 years ago, patients failed with atrial flutter, left or right, if you didn't do the, if you didn't do the mitral isthmus line <laughs> appropriately. And actually, in the original MACE procedure, they used to leave clips where they did this mitral valve isthmus line, metal clips, so when, when and if the patient will have a left atrial flutter, or what they call today mitral flutter, which is atypical flutter, the cardiologist will know exactly where it is so they can complete the lesion. So that's hybrid procedure, you know, per se, happened in 1987. By the way, this uh, September 1987, almost 30 years ago, is the first maze procedure. So, so uh, um, I think that uh, it's important to, to notice the, all this and understand the, the, that because the arrhythmia as we see today, because a lot of what the patient had uh, uh, incomplete catheter ablations are more focal arrhythmias, uh, multiple different uh, type of arrhythmias, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So even even that shifted because of incomplete lesions. So that's really really important. And obviously we are talking about the Bachmann bundle, uh, which is in the top of the left atrium. You know, uh, going uh, from right to left, which is kind of a, a, a band that conducts. Uh, uh, between the right and the left atrium uh, very, very well. So there are two, two important aspects. One is try to ablate the Bachmann bundle epicardially. It's, it makes it almost impossible because of its sickness. But secondly, if you are aware of the, in, of the, of the history of, of uh, uh, the surgical ablation of AF and the COX-1, the COX-1 was very, 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 very effective, but it it cut through the Bachmann bundle and created a situation where the right atrium was beating ahead of the entire heart. So the, the, the delay between the right atrium and the left atrium was exactly like the delay between the right atrium and the ventricles, which was about 180 milliseconds. And therefore, this was one of the reasons the, 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 the procedure was discontinued. So some of the ablations that we are being experiencing today, like the five box or the Dallas lesion set and so on and so forth, are going across the, the, the Bachmann bundle, which I think it's, a, it's a conceptually wrong. Uh, uh, and thankfully, because it's being done epicardially, it's unsuccessful, so we don't see this problem. But if it was successful, then it's a problem. So um, let's see uh, what's the ideal technology. So considering there is a wide range of wall thickness, uh, uh, of the, of the uh, normal and pathological atria. Uh, it is intuitively uh, obvious that any device delivering a set amount of energy for a set amount of time is unlikely to be consistently make, uh, consist to make consistently a uh, transmural lesion. So, so you have to understand that and, and every time you ablate a patient, this is a challenge we have. And, Right now, we are working with the companies on the next generation device to improve our ability to monitor the lesion as, as it's being made, made and, and not as it's being delivered, which is a different concept. So epicardial fat, I don't think uh, we have to show it. Uh, all of us here are uh, familiar with, with, with it, and this is a challenge. Um, it's very, very easy to explain that the more of pericardial fat you have, the harder it is uh, to get to the actual atrial tissue uh, and ablate. And um, I will talk a little bit about uh, uh, atrial myopathy and uh, some pathways that we recognize as uh, in basic signs that are uh, upregulated up uh, within the mitochondria and it's are actually uh, pretty much involved with uh, fat metabolism as well. So I think it's not coincidental that you see more fatty hearts in patients with atrial fibrillation than not. The heat sink effect is very, very important, and let's just uh, explain what it is. If you have, if you come to a blade uh, from the epicardium and you have to go through the, through the fat and then get through the muscle, and imagine you have this five to seven liter of blood flow basically in a set temperature. So if it's a cold temperature or a, or a warm temperature, uh, RF or cryo, you are basically washing everything very, very uh, uh, quickly. 
disallowing at least, or the least you're disallowing, let's assume that you can penetrate the others, the subendocardial region to be well ablated uh, and, and even more than that. So therefore, uh, different devices um, uh, were utilized, but not necessarily utilized the right way. The microwave, for instance, was removed from the, from the market, and I can tell you, just before it was removed from the market, I actually started to work with a company on a pulse therapy with microwave that actually showed to be very, very efficacious. But if, if you, you, you were looking at microwave in the context of non-beating uh, non heart uh, uh, conditions, uh, meaning putting the patient on bypass, maybe we would have an excellent device. And, and, and let's see uh, how, how we can tell it. So in the lab, they uh, basically uh, looked at, uh, um, looked at the different aspects of uh, cardiac output per liter per minute and the transmurality of the, uh, uh, of the, of the uh, lesion. And as you can see here, this is a longer lesion. This is a shorter lesion. There is no pulse therapy here, but the higher the flow, meaning the heat sink effect, the lower the transmurality. But when you get to a very low flow and a longer period of time, you get transmural lesion with a microwave technology that is no longer in the market. So I think this brings the, the, the point that it's, it's very, very, uh, it can be very, very effective, but depends on how we use the technology and um, whether we should reconsider it or not. It's, it's a different question. Uh, so how do we overcome uh, those uh, shortcomings? Well, all unipolar, all, all unipolar devices we have uh, tested to be very poor at creating transmural lesions, all of them. I mean, this is, it doesn't matter if it's cryo uh, on beating heart epicardially or it's, it's any of the RF technologies. It doesn't work well. Um, you, can, you can do the unipolar irrigated devices, suction devices, uh, you name it. I mean, and, um, and it's a it's very uh, it's a very uh, relatively very simple way to to test it. Uh, if you have um, uh, the line here that represent a transmural uh, lesion, and I'll get to the definition in a second, you can see that basically many of those dots are not where they were supposed to be, uh, and uh, almost unrelated to the amount of time that the ablation was, 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 uh, uh, took, took, took place. So if you have something that's only 80% of the time transmural, it's a problem. Now there are two, uh, there is another challenge here, because when you ablate with an epicardial, with an epicardial device along a line, okay, there is, there is, there is a question whether each dot or each area that you section the heart is transmural and the integrity of the entire line. And I think you'll see in the other word, works that, that basically these are two very, very important. You can have a lot of sections transmural, but some of the, but, but the line is not transmural because not all the sections are transmural. So if you say 92% transmural, it's the sections but it can be 0% transmural in a line, which is not, not always happens, but that theoretically can happen. So if you have a line that it's not transmural, it doesn't matter the 96% of the dots or the sections when you did it uh, are transmural. Transmurality is defined by, by as, as we said, by, by, by pathology only. So epicardial uh, bipolar devices, the cool rail is the most important one and um, um, going through some uh, scrutiny nowadays uh, um, uh, as part of the issues with the deep trial that we may have be able to uh, discuss later. And as you can see, again, 72 uh, cross sections, 77% of them were transmural with average depth of about 3.7 millimeters. So would you uh, use a device like this as a standalone therapy? I don't think so. Would you use a device like this as a hybrid therapy? That's remained to be seen because the basic principle in business is that if you have a failed startup, you can't resuscitate it with another failed startup. 
And we know that if this is failing, how can you resuscitate it with a failed technology, which is endocardial uh, ablation? But I may be wrong, because there are some interesting work, and, and uh, uh, Steve will talk about it after uh, I'll get you exa all exhausted, um, that you can actually uh, get some, some maybe good results uh, if, you, if you work uh, together. So, <clears throat> so by mapping uh, uh, um, none of the 12 linear lesions created demonstrated conduction block at 30 days. So 77% transmural, none of the lines has conduction block. So that's another important point. When we introduce a technology to a blade atrium, the acute results may be completely different than the chronic results. And this goes back to something that came from Steve's place when he was in Asheville, that actually we're able to show, and I'm sure he will show you, that there is a difference if you do a single state hybrid or a delayed stage hybrid. Uh, and I think part of it is because of, 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 of that acute effect versus chronic effect. You can do an experiment next time you are, you are with an AFI patient. You can cut over the patient, and I can tell you, I bet you that five out of ten times, just after cardioversion, you wouldn't be able to conduct across the pulmonary veins. You can create an exit block because the atrium is stunned. So, Acute conduction block is important because if you don't achieve it, you know that there is no acute conduction block. But what does it say about the future uh, of the lesion is remain to be seen. Single ablation uh, uh, versus two ablation uh, or reduction of, of the flow in the cavity. And I think this is your work, Matt. Um, um, so um, maybe come over here real quick and tell us about it. So this was actually a study that I wrote up that they had done in the lab around 2012. And they were using, uh, they were performing epicardial bipolar radiofrequency ablation on the beating heart, trying to improve it. Obviously, that's not consistent with the way that the, cox mate, that the full biatrial coxmase 4 is performed today. But the idea would be that, based on Dr. Uh, Melby's work that was discussed earlier, um, that reducing blood th flow through the heart or through performing ablation multiple times at the same site, you could improve the rate of transmurality. And so we see that clinically. Many people will fire ablation devices even just around the pulmonary veins multiple times, resulting in a faster impedance drop and more efficacy. And similarly, off-pump maneuvers that can be safe, such as bicaval occlusion, to reduce blood flow can significantly increase the transmurality of lesions on the right atrium. Yeah. yeah. So, and you can see here, uh, on the left atrium, repeat ablations were significantly more effective with a transmurality rate of 71% versus 92. However, uh, even though vena cable so without vena cable occlusion, uh, using epicardial bipolar radiofrequency ablation on the beating heart, we had a transmurality rate of only 24%. It, in short, it didn't work. With vena cable occlusion, significantly reducing intracardiac blood flow and the heat sink effect of the circulating blood, you had a rate of transmurality that was 81%, which is significantly improved, although I would not say it's anywhere near equivalent to what you could do with an on-pump procedure. So, uh, unipolar, bipolar epicardial, and bipolar uh, cross-sectional, so to speak, or transmural. Um, so we learned that uh, uh, it is important uh, how, we uh, how we ablate and what do we do uh, in order to improve our transmurality. There are currently two bipolar uh, radiofrequency ablation devices in the market. Actually, Etrico is owning another one uh, after the acquisition of Aztec. 
their claim, but uh, it's not being utilized uh, uh, much, uh, if at all, in, in the U.S. And I don't, I'm not so sure what's going on worldwide. Um, and basically, it's based on on on, ba uh, on a very simple aspect of of uh, um, uh, conductivity uh, of, of measuring of the tissue conduction. Now, this algorithm has some issues with it, but uh, because a it is um, it is based on on, on healthy um, healthy animals for the cre creation of the model, but more importantly. The variation between tissue to tissue and surgeon to surgeon or how many times you apply, but as important, how many times you clean the clamp. So if you have some dirt on the clamp or dead tissue on the clamp, you are basically diverting the algorithm and, 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 and uh, creating a problem. However, if you do it the right way, this is what you should expect most of the time. There are, though, less recent and more recent uh, reports showing that even if it's, it's being done appropriately, the, re the reconnection or the non-transmural lesion rate is fairly high. And even in the end of, of, of most, one of the most uh, uh, experienced surgeons, uh, Mark Lamer, uh, in those epicardial ablation, he just published a paper from uh, Belgium showing that uh, uh, in 9% of the cases, he had reconnection across the pulmonary veins utilizing this technology. But this is by far the best technology, RF technology we have. And there are multiple papers to show it, uh, that, that basically dry bipolar RF ablation has very good clinical results. I can tell you that the uh, cell line irrigation is, 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 is as, as good, uh, although argument, you know, the device itself uh, has some limitations. So surgeons, as surgeons, we don't like it so much, but it works well. But very important is that um, you, can, you can achieve uh, transmural lesion or conduction <laughs> blocks, let's say, not transmural lesion, with, with about three applications plus minus, you know, the standard deviation with about 30 seconds in each, in each, in each side. The device of today is uh, slightly better than what it used to be. Uh, now you have uh, uh, basically two electrodes, so it, it, it helps with, with the algorithm, and it also helps with the width of the, of the uh, ablation line, which probably will improve uh, to some extent uh, the transmorality. Um, this is the width of the lesion, so you see the older generation and, and the um, uh, newer generation. Technical tips, so fully mobilize the pulmonary veins. Uh, don't bunch tissue, make sure it's, it's as flat as possible. Because you have to understand that if the, if, the, if the pulmonary veins are like two, three millimeters thickness, when you bunch them, it's six millimeters. If you go to the antrum, and the atrium there is you know, three to four millimeters, when you clamp it, it's seven, eight millimeters in thickness. So it's significant. Um, if you can't do it as a, as a two, do it as an uh, isolated pulmonary veins, one by one, it's as good. And, um, um, and this is controlled by an algorithm, so you have to understand char and fat and air can be of a problem. And uh, the modern way of doing it is to clamp, and we'll show it in the lab, go for the beep, 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 beep that says that the conductivity is low, leave it closed, and step on it again. And if it is less than 10 seconds, it's probably okay. If it's less than five seconds until the next beep beep, it's probably uh, better. And this is the new way of, of doing it in the past, let's say 18 months or so, and, and we are looking into the results with that. Uh, so it's the shortcomings, uh, it's arrested the heart in, in sometimes, uh, um, um, it limits, uh, limits you only to the PVI on a beating heart, uh, and you cannot perform a full maze with it. Anybody that says you can perform full maze procedure with bipolar clamp is wrong. You can't cause safely the, the uh, AV grooves. Actually, you can cause damage. There are some, some reports on that, and it's very, very hard to get around the mitral valve isthmus. The unipolar bipolar device, it's a, it's a very interesting concept. You suck tissue and then you are bled bipolarly, epicardially. Um, 
you get bipolar energy, thin tissue, uh, less than seven millimeters, and you complete with an algorithm for uh, unipolar. Uh, I am uh, intimately involved with this, uh, with this device in the past. I was the PI for the FDA study that stopped with the acquisition of Aztec uh, by Etricure. Uh, but the shortcoming of this device is that you can have the entire seven millimeter or whatever of fat filling your uh, bipolar application and basically negate the entire effect. And as you can see here, um, this device is 94 of all lesion. As I said, if you just look at the sections, however, only 68% of the lines were transmural. And we, I just came from Europe a few days ago. We were in a meeting, a big meeting in Europe that uh, one of the leading centers on, uh, on the uh, fusion device, uh, the, the EP cardiologist presented the data and only 17% um, of the lesions were transmural uh, six weeks out, uh, which begs the question, uh, what are we going to do next with this technology? Uh, so unidirectional devices, as I said, I don't want to come back to it again and again and again. It's unpredicted, and therefore you have to be uh, very, very careful. We have, um, we have different uh, cryoprobes. These are the old cryoprobes. Uh, from Cooper Surgical. This is the maze probe that was designed by us when we were at Georgetown. Uh, we started with a small five millimeter probe that we just cut the insulation and created our maze probes and then the company came and, 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 and did it for us. This probe is limited compared to this one that, which I'm very familiar with uh, because of the way we designed the, the head of it. It's flexible, uh, but it's stiff enough. Uh, so this is the one that uh, basically is uh, working today. Um, um, the company has some other devices, but uh, uh, I think that this one is very effective. As you can see here, the nitric oxide based uh, can achieve high rate of transmorality, but again, cryo, uh, you need to be on bypass, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, how to apply cryo uh, uh, when, you, when you do it. So endocardial beating ablation, uh, beating heart ablation can result in, in, in very high uh, success rate with, with transmorality. So again, thickness of tissue. Thickness of tissue also is a, is a factor with cryo. Um, um, and this is a study that's going to be published soon where we compared in vitro uh, the two devices in the market, the cryo 2 and the metronic one. The metronic is a, is a, um, a, a device that's based on argon, then go very cold, and the etricure is a little uh, uh, warmer. And as you can see, uh, if we are considering the minus 30 as a, as a killing zone, then the thicker the tissue is, the less, tem uh, you know, lower temperature you get when it comes to cryo. So for instance, if you ablate a six millimeter tissue to get to the minus 40, you need almost the entire two minutes time before you get, uh, minus 30, I mean, to, to get to, to that temperature, uh, with the cryo 2, as opposed to um, uh, uh, getting to it farther, uh, rather quickly when it comes to the argon base. Why it's important? It's important because um, we have to modify the duration of the freezing. The problem is that we cannot predict it when we are in the OR, but we need to be aware of it. So what happens if you increase the lesion, uh, the, the cryo to three minutes? I tell you, it may be working well, but it may be not working well. And uh, I can, we are showing it in the paper that actually the, the algorithm of, of, of uh, cooling tissue is different between the two devices. And the longer is not necessarily better when it comes to this device. The rewarming is also very interesting because this is a, an out, you know, a, a rewarming of the probe as opposed to leaving the probe for another 20 seconds. And you can see that basically the graphs are and the same uh, rate of rewarming of the tissue, which is another interesting point that I'm uh, looking at it more and more. As important, even more important, when you look throughout the, 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 the length of the probe, the temperature are not identical in the proximal and the distal part of the probe, okay? This is for the four millimeter tissue. And what we had, we had eight temp probes along the, the, along the probe because when you read minus 60, it's only at one point. It's not in the tissue, which is, which is maybe more important. And as you can see, it changes between 
the, the different uh, thicknesses of the tissue, although it do, it's not as important when it comes to the metronic one because it's always below the, the, temp the, the temperature that, that is the killing temperature. This is the tissue temperature, as I said, uh, but it may be important when it comes to the cryo two. And as a rule of thumb, I never freeze with a full 10 centimeters with a cryo two. I always freeze only six, maybe seven centimeters because the proximal part, as you can see, can be much warmer. So the igloo effect is important because if, A, if the tissue is not dry and you ablate uh, fluid, blood, or whatever it is, you create an insulation. Basically, you are freezing uh, something against, against the tissue, but it's not the probe against the tissue. But it's also the same apply when you freeze tissue because then you have to push the ice ball forward and the ice ball maybe isolate you from, from you know, if the tissue is too thick. So I don't think myself um, and this is where I have disagreement with Ralph, that three, cent three, mi three uh, minutes can overcome uh, the, 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 the thickness of the tissue. I think that actually with cryo you need a pulse therapy, and that's what I do. I freeze, if it's a very thick tissue, I freeze for one minute, stop, one minute, stop, one minute, stop, etc., etc. Or you do one or two minutes, depends on how it looks uh, when the ice ball uh, is there. It's safe on the valves. Uh, you know, do not rush to rewarm. It's it's okay, but but we have to look at the mechanism. We don't have time of cryo. I don't I don't necessarily agree with that, uh, and you should avoid coronaries uh, as possible. So um, these are the lesion set of the Cox Maze procedure, and the only device we have approved right now uh, for that. Uh, uh, is actually the ETRQ device, uh, the bipolar one with an indication. Uh, but as you see, uh, the lesions are being uh, either cut and sew, whatever technology you use with some cryo, uh, and you can do the entire procedure with a cryo. So the conclusion that uh, atrial wall thickness is uh, variable, uh, we talk about it, bipolar ablation, cryo ablation are the most uh, effective. Uh, and you'll see this uh, translate into the, the, the uh, guidelines that I will talk about. And uh, you have to be aware of all of that when you are ablating, uh, because I think the real challenge we have now is to move, move the needle into minimally invasive procedure, and we'll both talk about it in next talks, but maintain the quality, because otherwise we are not going to be successful. Thank you. So now we do. Thank you, Niv. Um, now, we, are, we were uh, scheduled to give the Daishan Wong Award, which will be explained to you at 11 o'clock, and the recipients of the award are outside. So this is going to be like a five or seven minute uh, interlude, and then we will resume our session. Steve Igo will, uh, will, will explain to you what the award is about. This is, it's a wonderful couple that has been really very generous of their time um, and resources uh, in, uh, in supporting cardiac surgery. So um, uh, let's, let's, let's wait for everyone to come in and, uh, and, uh, and have a seat, and then I'll uh, hand it over to Steve Igo. Uh, St Steve, what's your official title? Uh, director of the Entrepreneurial Institute. Yeah, so, so Steve is the director of the Entrepreneurial Institute um, uh, in our heart center. And he's, uh, he's a great go-to guy for developing stuff. He's actually helping me develop a cannula right now. Uh, but uh, uh, he's, a, he's a wonderful guy. And he will be explaining to you what the award is about and, uh, and who these wonderful, uh, this wonderful couple is that will be receiving it. Steve? Thank you. So can we, uh, can we see that first slide, please? So um, we're here today to um, honor Linda and Jack Gill and uh, with the uh, Daishan Wong Memorial Service Award. We have some folks here that are going to tell us about it. Um, let's see which. So the Daishan Wong uh, Award was established in 2010. Um, it was first uh, presented at our Pumps and Pipes meeting um, in 2013. This year, we have formed a partnership uh, with the organization uh, sponsoring this award uh, with Pumps and Pipes. I want to just take a minute to 
talk a little bit about pumps and pipes. Uh, this is the 10th year, actually the 11th year, sorry, uh, for the organization. It is a cross-industry collaboration, essentially a professional society, um, uh, between energy, aerospace, and medicine. Um, Dr. Lumsden, who's here, Chairman of the Department of Cardiovascular Surgery, is the founder of Pumps and Pipes. I'm the Executive Director. Um, founding organizations were ExxonMobil, Houston Methodist, Heart and Vascular Center, University of Houston, and NASA. Um, we try to find ways uh, of, of um, collaborating together, or what Dr. Lumsden calls looking in the other guy's toolkit. Last year, uh, Pumps and Pipes 10, we uh, webcast our symposium live. We had over 5,000 people watch our webcast during that day. Um, 88 countries, all 50 states. It is a diverse audience. Uh, we have astronauts, uh, heart surgeons, um, uh, students, uh, college students, high school students. We even go down to the middle school level. So it is a... Um, um, a day of education, talking to one another, meeting new friends, and then hopefully this will lead to collaborations. So I'm going to introduce now uh, Jeff uh, Applegate. He's with the Gulf Coast Medical Device Manufacturers Association. He's going to tell you a little bit more about this award. My name is Jeff Applegate, um, and I am uh, CEO of uh, uh, Texas Injection Molding and we're a contract uh, injection molding company. Um, this organization started uh, about uh, eight or nine years ago. Uh, Mark Hendricks, who at that time was leading a contract uh, medical device manufacturer, ma manufacturing company here in town, uh, he and I were at a BioHouston event and we were looking around and, and uh, knowing that the, the Texas Medical Center was spending $2 billion a year in R&D and we were seeing uh, technology coming out but then being commercialized outside of the Houston area we said what can we do to help keep that here and when we started talking to folks they said well, we just can't get it done in Houston there's just not the resources and we're looking around we knew all these resources we were all in our different silos so that was the idea of how we come up with Gulf Coast medical device manufacturers which was a community of folks that were trying to help commercialize medical devices in the Houston area and so we started that and uh, grew that and have been doing it for a number of years and found that many of us did things beyond medical devices and we uh, then formed the uh, Greater Houston Manufacturers Association. Um, let's see how do I, this is the, it's, it's the forward here. Mm -hmm. There you go. Okay. Um, give you a little background of Daishan Wong. When we founded it, Daishan had a regulatory consulting uh, organization and as we did education seminars is how do you take your medical device and bring it to market Daishan was there to help people all along the way he he we would put medical device 101 seminars together and Daishan Wong would 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 conduct and lead those and he was a uh, really tireless uh, advocate for for getting things done and and helping people um, he was in his own community the, the Chinese American community um, when they needed a playground built, he was there. When they needed something at the church done, he was there. And he, he was just an amazing person as far as his love for the community, his love for the, the, the professional community as well as the, the community that he operated in in the Chinese American community. Um, and he supported the medical device uh, area as well. Okay, sorry. What we looked at, what, Dai Shan Wong came down with uh, pancreatic cancer, died quickly. And it was a big loss for our organization and um, a big loss for us personally. We lost a dear friend. And we said, what can we do to try to recognize Dai Shan for his contribution and what can we do to, uh, to, to remember him? And so we established this award for that purpose. And we said, what are the characteristics of Dai Shan that we want to celebrate? And those are people that have a demonstrated leadership in entrepreneurial efforts to commercialize the medical device technology. Someone that shows a spirit of collaboration with a community of local entrepreneurs that works to get well together with others. Uh, generously de donates their time and energy to help other people succeed. 
uh, display a genuine, genuine welfare or concern for the welfare of others. And Dishon was um, amazing both on a personal and professional level. And then maintain high ethical and professional standards. So that's what we were looking at. What are the, the what are the candidates? And this is a, a slate of the candidates that we've recognized. And I would those those Reese Terry, who's the founder of Cyberonics, is here. He was the 2015 nomination. So congratulations, Reese, and uh, we're glad that you could make it here. And these are other folks that many of you may know that have uh, contributed to the Houston community, to the medical device community, um, volunteered their times, and, and met those standards. So that's a, a little bit of background on the Daishan Wong Award, and uh, I want to uh, you know, thank you for the opportunity to celebrate you guys. So we're going to step through a little bit of um, background on Linda and Jack Gill. And I should let Linda and Jack know that this conference today is uh, the Reevolution Conference Summit is on minimally invasive cardiac surgery. So we have cardiac surgeons in the audience from all over the country. Uh, they are proctors here, as well as they, there are people in the audience that will be training uh, this afternoon. So uh, they're going to, I think, understand what is going on as we step through this. So a little bit of background on Jack, native Texan, graduated from Lamar University, PhD from Indiana University, majored in organic uh, chemistry. Linda is a native uh, Kentuckian, graduated University of Kentucky. She has an honorary doctorate at University of Kentucky in 2001. Uh, Jack and Linda were married in 1969 in San Francisco. Their son Jason, I believe, is here today. There he is in the back, he's attending. Um, so we're really happy that he's here with us today for this award for his parents. They are also proud grandparents as well. Linda talks about the grandchildren a lot. So, how do we define Jack Gill? Um, Jack calls this his logo bio, and this is the easiest way to do this. It would take a long time to talk my way through this, so I'm gonna pause for five seconds, 10 seconds, and just let you look at this slide and see all the things that Jack Gill has been and is involved in. So let's focus in on a few things. The Gill Foundation of Texas is a philanthropic organization uh, that has sponsored a number of, uh, uh, of uh, programs and um, uh, institutions as well, including the Gill Center uh, for Biomolecular Science at Indiana University. He established the Goose Society of Texas, which stands for the Grand or Order of Su Successful Entrepreneurs. Uh, he's also a member of the Horatio Alger Association. Um, Jack and, and Linda are involved in numerous scholarship programs um, uh, around the United States. They founded the, uh, the Gil Hart Institute at University of Kentucky. And I just want to make a couple of comments here about Linda. Um, Linda has 40 years of volunteering. And primarily, she's volunteered in medical institutions. And primarily, she's volunteered in areas of like the intensive care unit. Uh, she was at Stanford University Medical Center in Palo Alto, uh, where Jack uh, had a successful <laughs> venture capital firm. Uh, so she interfaced with Norman Shumway, uh, perhaps on an almost daily basis. Uh, she was also uh, at uh, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And we're really happy to say that she's been here with us at Houston Methodist uh, for the last 21 years. She's the family liaison in the cardiovascular intensive care unit. And I took this picture of Linda yesterday at her desk uh, with her notebook, uh, which she always has with her. And um, um, as she told me at lunch one day, uh, when she is in, in that uh, family waiting room, she owns that family waiting room that day that she's there. So, I'm going to show a, few, a couple of slides here that all of you know this, but I think that for us, we wanted to reinforce it in what Linda does for us here at Houston Methodist. So let's talk about the world of the cardiovascular intensive care unit. As you know, it's composed of healthcare providers, doctors, nurses, technicians, 
Uh, of course, the patient is central in, in, in the intensive care unit, and then there's also the family. So all of these are interrelated, and Linda is right in the middle of all of that. And in fact, as you all know, uh, in an intensive care unit, the cardiovascular intensive care unit, there's a spectrum of human emotions on any given day. Um, perhaps there are as many as 100 family members in the intensive uh, care unit waiting room uh, during the day. Linda is the liaison that brings them back to the unit to see their family members when they come out of surgery. She interfaces with the physicians and, and puts them in contact with one another. She is very important. She is the glue that holds the intensive care unit family waiting room together. And for me, I'm just so pleased that Jack and Linda could be with us today uh, to uh, receive this award. It means a lot to us. And so I would like you to uh, join me in welcoming that this year's recipients of the Daishong Wong Award, Linda and Jack Gill. I'm going to the award later. So, Dr. Lumsden, come up and say a few words, perhaps. Thank you. I'll let you present that. Well, first of all, congratulations and thank you for your contribution, both at Mathis and in the Houston community at large. I mean, you saw that list of bullet points describing the qualities, and each one of those individuals could easily get this, but it's a true honor for us to be able to give it to you together. Um, I think I've known Jack a long time, and I didn't even know that Linda was married to, to Jack. <clears throat> And so we go out of the way this works in our waiting room. Now, you've all seen that huge tower that's being built that we're very proud of. We don't show you our ICUs and the operating rooms that we're in the waiting room in particular uh, that we're currently in because they've been running for 50 years. Fonda Brown operating room on my desk is the opening day operating room schedule from 1968. And so it's uh, Dr. DeBakey, Stanley Crawford, Cooley, all these guys basically were in there. And that's going to close next year as we kind of move over and we're hoping we're going to keep that name going. But the ORs are fine, but the ICUs are kind of like you expect Florence Nightingale to kind of come out and make rounds for us. And it's even harder, I think, on the patient's families. Patients are asleep, they're sedated. But some of our families are in those waiting rooms for weeks, and it's not exactly the nicest place. You're going to love where, where we are, where we are going to. No. But the dirty secret is that I've been trying to get Mark Boom to build that tower for years, and I had to use your name. I told him, look, you know, Linda's just mad. You know, we need that new ICU waiting room built. And that was really what tipped it. So, you know, a billion-dollar tower later, thank you very much, Linda. It wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for you. But again, there's also one to honor Michael. I'm sure Linda would be the first one. These are folks who are in that waiting room every day and often have to deal with some very difficult situations. Not always good news. And then we walk away as the surgeons at that point in time and we leave a bunch of other people behind to kind of help pick up the pieces you know, of the emotions that are flowing around there. So I can't think of anyone or any couple who are more deserving. And thank you very much indeed for your contribution to us. Thank you. And I'll Mark, come and give you a award. Thank you all. Uh, it's, it's an honor, really, to be able to honor people like that, and they really are an inspiration to us. Um, we're going to uh, continue with the AFib session. Uh, we've got uh, two more talks. Uh, uh, Dr. Ad will speak on, uh, on the Cox Maze 4, which is an extension and evolution of what he just spoke on, and then 
Dr. Hoff will, uh, uh, will, uh, will talk about uh, what he's going to uh, say. Now, um, we're running a little bit behind, but we've still got time to complete it. I, I, I do want to have uh, enough time for questions after this, and I'm pretty sure we'll be able to get to the lab on time, perhaps with an abbreviated lunch break, but that's okay, because uh, I do think that this is an important session. Niv? Yeah, so I, uh, I'll breeze through this. Uh, can we have the slide back? Okay. So I'll breeze through this um, rather quickly. So as we said, the first part was the technology. The second part was a, a paper came in 98 that led us to believe that most of the problem, if not all of it, it's in the pulmonary veins. Now, there are papers from the same time by known electrophysiologists that didn't show the same thing. And the concept of us thinking that this is all from the pulmonary vein is the wrong concept, and I'll walk through, I don't want to be uh, uh, too labor about it, but, but uh, this is what you see in mechanism of AFib based on the AHRS guidelines. And the, f the first time I saw it, I said, well, this is, this is a joke. I mean, nobody understand it, nobody can explain it. I mean, it's, it's all based on partial fact, multiple fact, and so on and so forth. And most importantly, some of those mechanisms are based on patients that were mapped after ablation. That ablation can cause arrhythmia and ablation can cause a different mechanism of arrhythmia. So basically there, are, there is a lot of uh, uh, to be said, and, 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 and again, Wash you, uh, Ralph and his lab, but also Yoram Rudy, who is another uh, important uh, individual in, in developing mapping systems, and the new, new and up and coming one is the Cardio Insight, actually show that basically if you look, go to uh, Chronic atrial fibrillation, which is the old terminate, the, the definition, basically you can tell that this is right and left atrium, and sometimes none of them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, as a word of caution, I think that what we need to pay attention to more than 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 the type of AFib is basically the duration of AF. Duration of AF, in my mind, is basically more more important than any of the types. And this is your Moody's work showing that basically if you have a complexity index, meaning that, you know, how you map it and so on and so forth, it, it is more complex, it is less easy to explain when you come to patients that are more complex. And this is why we all shift our attention in surgery, at least not to the non-paroxysmal, which I think it may be a mistake. And I can actually start to prove it now and, and we will come with some publication because now we are mapping all patients with mitral disease with cardio insight and it's, it's kind of interesting what we find. We also, uh, ourselves, we, this is the first of our works, but we have some, some others coming, show that basically it doesn't matter where you biopsy the atrium. If you look at mitochondrial function or dysfunction, it's basically a systemic, both left and right atrium. So theoretically, any part of the atrium can fibrillate at any point. And we find those uh, uh, mechanisms that are com completely aberrant in patients with atrial fibrillation. So I, I don't know if this is the right way to describe it. I think it's a moving target. And, and basically, uh, this, is, so this is why the, the maze is working. So what characterizes AFib? Um, it's, you know, atrial remodeling is very important, associated with AF duration probably, probably not a stable model, meaning that if you map the same patient 365 days a, week, a year, you're not going to find the same mechanism every time. It's going to look different. And um, basically, at a certain threshold, AF results in a systemic biatrial disease. Subset is very, very modified, and, and we have to be very, very careful. And we have no ability to predict in a given patient what's the mechanism of tomorrow. We might be able to predict what's the mechanism of today. So ablating the mechanism of tomorrow or today is not necessarily the mechanism of tomorrow. So I use this example. The, Choluteca Teca Bridge in Honduras, I, I, I'm sure I missed, uh, mispronounced it. That's a very interesting story. And I think after you see the picture, it will go with you. And every time you ablate a patient, you're going to remember it. Because what happened there is every hurricane season, the river was uh, flooded, the bridges were destroyed, 
and the two parts of the city uh, from two sides of the, the river were not, were not co connected. So the Japanese uh, Hazemad and the corporation decided to build the bridge that's going to sustain hurricane force of 10 or whatever. Nothing is going to break it. And Mitch came, Hurricane Mitch came in the late 90s, dropped uh, 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 a lot of rain over the place and you know, days of devastation, not just there, but uh, across uh, certain parts of Middle and North America. And after it was all uh, said and done, this was left. So the bridge sustained the hurricane, but the problem moved. And I think, I think it's funny, but I think when I saw this picture, I said, aha, uh -huh, now I get it. This is why the maze is working, because the maze is multiple bridge trying to predict the future of the problem. So it's a very primitive concept. It's not based on any sophisticated ablation or uh, mapping. It's not based on any of this. It's based on probability uh, how to eliminate the existence of atrial fibrillation and not how it starts. And this is why it's so successful. So we have to be very, very uh, 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 careful before we move it on. And even the most perfect catheter ablation try to imitate the maze procedure. So if you try to imitate, imitate a, 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 an anatomical approach, why would you map? Save yourself money, save yourself time, and just go for an anatomical approach. So there is more to the story, but I think that the strength of the maze procedure is basically that, <coughs> that you know, we can't map the, the patients and, and, and predict what's going to start it tomorrow. Um, um, and even, even uh, uh, the most extensive uh, hybrid uh, integrated approach are based on anatomical approach, which is mimicking the maze procedure. And the big advantage of hybrid procedure, I think today, today is that we learn from the failures and we can improve what we are doing. And as I alluded to earlier, we are working on the next generation devices. So why the maze works? Because it is an anatomical approach. And I, I never uh, eliminated this lesion, but everything but this lesion is what we call the maze three or four and so on and so forth. But everything is maze three. This is not, the maze four is just you know, uh, because you isolate the pulmonary veins bilaterally, okay, and and um, uh, but but the 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 concept, the electrophysiological concept, is the same as the maze three. Nothing is new here, except for a couple of lesions going to the appendages instead of cutting them, which was part of our work in the in, in at Georgetown. And I can tell you a quick story. You know that Dr. Cox was almost sued by a patient because one of the nurses of Dr. Cox told the patient that he had a maze four, but he came for maze three. And this is a true story because the maze, you know, with a conception that this is not a cut and sew maze, uh, uh, she called it a maze four, but it's actually a maze three lesion set. So it's kind of interesting. So when we publish today, we, we call it maze three four because electrophysiologically it's the same concept. And he never called it Cox maze, by the way. He always called it a maze procedure. So we said all that. We know biatrial is more uh, efficient than efficacy than the uniatrial, and, and we need to uh, move forward and work on it. So left-sided worked very, very well, and I'll breeze through it. This is a paper we published uh, last January in the annals. We look into only in our uh, left-sided maze procedure paper in Innova. Um, we didn't have so many, but we have quite a few, 150, I think. And as you can see, success rate of antiretmic drugs for all comers is 79% <coughs> at, at two years, which is not, not so bad. And we didn't find any difference between PVI only and a more complete lesion set. But um, Look at this, I think this is important. If you look at predictors for failures, at zero or over two, when I consider it for now, age, size of left atrium, type of atrial fibrillation, and duration of atrial fibrillation, if you have zero predictors, you have very good success rate, 91% in two years of medication. I mean, it's a small group of patients, but it's consistent for PVI and left-sided only. However, if you have two predictors, it drops to 70, 71% in two years. 
And, and there is more to the story because, um, because there is a selection bias here. Uh, as in our place, the patient that went for left-sided only needed to be a little bit uh, 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 on a low side of a risk of recurrence. And more importantly, age. The older patients had left arterial only, and age is the strongest predictor. If you go and read the paper in, in, in completeness, you see the age is the most consistent uh, predictor of failure when it comes to left-sided only. And mind you, the older patients, we want to take them off anticoagulation, and therefore this is probably not, not always the right thing to do. Also, we compare, com compared in a, in a well-quoted paper now uh, different uh, approaches as a, as, uh, for safety and efficacy. A lot of epicardial paper, hybrid procedure, only two full cryo-maze procedure minimally invasively. And as you can see here, at uh, one year, there's already significant difference in success rate between the on-pump, standalone cryo-maze procedure versus the different others and it comes in a price of probably higher complication rates in the off-pump procedures compared to the minimally invasive cryo maze procedures. That brought us to uh, the new AATS guidelines. You know, the European published their guidelines. STS and AATS actually were coordinated in the effort, uh, and the AATS is the last of the three to come out, uh, used a different methodology uh, for uh, statistically assessment of the, of the data, and we came with some uh, um, um, uh, recommendation. Basically, hybrid procedure is a class 2B with the uh, evidence of non-randomized studies. Hopefully, there are a couple now that, uh, that are randomized uh, control studies that uh, um, may add to our uh, um, uh, information. Epicardial ablation, minimal invasive non-hybrid is a class 2A. Uh, because there are some uh, randomized studies in the, st in, in the, in, in, in the literature. The, the, the FAST is the most uh, uh, famous one, but there are other, a couple more, and so on and so forth. But, but as important, we basically show that, that um, we had a recommendation for ablation technology and uh, with cryoablation on pump and bipolar on and off pump, and basically, we do not recommend the use of unipolar unidirectional radio frequency ablation outside of clinical trial as the efficacy are questionable. This is in the guidelines now, and it has very high evidence rate uh, based on the, the work from, from, from uh, Ralph's uh, lab. The other point now, uh, before I show you quickly the results from our minimal invasive standalone maze procedure, is the, the myth that Biatria lesion set is associated with high rate of pacemakers if performed appropriately. There is a paper coming in June of Thoracic next month from our center, um, close to 800 full maze procedures uh, with 7% um, um, pacemaker rate and only 2% pacemaker rate in standalone atrial fibrillation. For the concomitant one, the predictor for a pacemaker was multiple valve uh, procedures, which are nothing with the maze procedure. And the problem, and especially the problem in the New England Journal of Medicine paper uh, from, from Gilinov, is the way you handle the right atrium. And I can tell you, I wasn't yelled a lot in my career as a resident, uh, except for by my wife. But uh, uh, the only one time that Jim Cox actually yelled at me was when I grabbed the lateral part of the atrium when I was assisting him on a maze procedure. He said, don't ever dare to grab this part with your pickups. What do I see every time I proctor a maze procedure? I see that basically this is the most abused part of the atrium by any surgeon. Why it's important? It's important because we don't really know where the sinus node is. I know, you know, and we all went through anatomy classes and so on and so forth, and we also don't know where the sinus node area, tachycardia area is. It's somewhere along the, the lateral wall and the crystal terminalis, and you can learn more about it. But more important, more importantly, in patients with long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, often the sinus node is damaged. It's fibrosed. And therefore, all the rhythm, or what we call sinus rhythm, will, will be generated from this area. So if you violate the corridor, you make it too narrow, or you abuse it with pickups and so on and so forth, you are going to end up with issues. 
and the issues are that it's not going to conduct well. This is why I modified the maze procedure on the right side, and basically I am no longer doing the, the, that lesion going laterally uh, uh, from the right atrial appendage, and I still do the lesion going to the 10 o'clock of the tricuspid valve, that's medially, and, and, and basically uh, the same way here. And mind you, even if I do an atriotomy, I do it very far away, I don't do it here, I do it down here. Now I know that there is a new lesion that Etricure is pushing that goes from here to here to skip this one. I think this is a dangerous lesion. It will create many, many more pacemakers because often surgeons will do this because you don't see well. If you want to avoid this bursting here and you have an atriotomy, take the cryoprobe, bend it, slide it to the inside, lay it against, with the, with the belly of it, lay it against the tricuspid valve and ablate all the way up. You don't have to be inside out if you're doing a robot or you're doing whatever. This will cause many, many more pacemakers. The other point is when you do the SVC lesion, imagine that you sit in the right, in the left, in the right atrium, the lesion should go down to the seven o'clock. It shouldn't be laterally or, or upwards. By doing all this, you are going to have much less pacemakers. Now, the right, the left side is, is basically nothing have changed. You circle the pulmonary veins with a cryo and basically a lesion to the, a lesion to the uh, base of the left atrial appendage. This is the most important lesion maybe uh, uh, that we all, most of us miss is basically the, epica the endocardial cryo lesion going to the mitral valve depends where the coronar is. And you see that, uh, that blue dot, they have to basically overlap and this is an epicardial lesion to going to the uh, coronary sinus. And the way to do it minimally invasively as the oblique sinus is open is basically put your retractor here and pull up so you can actually see the coronary sinus and just focus on that. You don't have to ablate the entire back wall again because you are running a risk that the tip of your ablator, if you are epicardially, is going to lay on the ventricle and then you are going to have some arrhythmias, uh, more significant, some more significant than others when you go uh, into the post-op care. If you do that, you can have a very, very good reliable results. So, we did over, over 300 standalone mazes in the past uh, uh, 11 years, uh, you know, until the point I left Inova, but only 133 of them were qualified to be uh, uh, minimally invasive for long, for long standing persistent or persistent atrial fibrillation. So we took the paroxysmal out, we took the mid sternotomy out, and this is what we left with. And we have some 60 some patients with five years follow up, which is Believe it or not, the largest series in the, in the literature when this will get to be published. What do we learn from here? Well, not too much. Those are fairly healthy patients, I would say. Duration of AFib is, is quite long and left atrium is 4.9. If we combine duration of AFib over five years and left atrium over 5.5 centimeters, we have 15% uh, of this uh, population. So those are the extreme. Uh, but as you can see, 78% long-standing persistent and um, uh, median ablation uh, numbers is one to two, uh, is two, but very interestingly, only 50% of them or so had previous catheter ablation. And this is what I always say, when you work with your cardiologist, with the EPs, and they know what you do, and they know what you deliver, and you communicate, they would not even send their patient to a catheter ablation before they send the patient to you. So when I hear surgeons say, hey, nobody's going to send me patients, I say, of course, because you're not serious about it. So, so I, think, I think after you'll see the results, you understand why we need to keep in the algorithm, why we, do we, we need to keep a, 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 a minimal invasive maze procedure. Look at the results. Prolonged ventilation over, over 24 hours, five patients, pneumonia, one patient, no strokes. One TIA in a patient that had five ablation before that made us change our, our philosophy and with these patients we start IV heparin two hours after surgery when we see that there is no uh, issue. Uh, two reoperations for bleeding, one of them, you know, I know it's an excuse, but it's a patient who couldn't get uh, portamine, so we took him the next day to evacuate a, a chest wall hematoma. Only 3% with transfusion of blood and 6% of any transfusion, no renal failure, 
Median stay of four days, usually for anticoagulation, readmission for arrhythmia within 30 days of 11% and no death at 30 days. Okay, so I think this shows safety. And what about efficacy? Well, single intervention, and this is very important. The guidelines would say that there are two definitions. One, being in sinus rhythm, and being in sinus rhythm after intervention. So if you have a patient, let's say you have 100 patients, they had a procedure, they had a hybrid, let's say two-stage hybrid, and then a year out, the patient has an AFib, had an ablation, and was monitored three months later as in sinus rhythm. That's a failure, because you have a procedure that's beyond the index procedure. This is a single procedure success. At five years, 79% of medication, 90% if you allow medication. Okay, now, what are the other issues? These are whole halter monitoring 24 hours. So people will say, aha, you don't do event monitors. Well, the, the reveal, even if you put it here, we wouldn't have it here. So nobody has data on reveal for five years. But more importantly, two years and six months, all the patients that were asymptomatic off medication were offered to have a, a one week halter monitoring. And guess what? 98% of the patients that were in sinus rhythm by halter were in sinus rhythm by one week halter monitoring. The only failure was a patient with continuous atrial fibrillation, long-standing persistent, at one event of 47 seconds. But 30 seconds is a failure. Now, the reveal is not, more, is not capturing less than two minutes. That's another problem. So those are excellent results, and we are very, very proud. And I can tell you more. Look at the, at the way the burden looks. These are the types of AFib that we monitor for the patient. The fact that it's, it's, the patient is in AFib doesn't necessarily mean that they are in continuous AFib. In a matter of fact, the continuous, the, the, there are no continuous uh, AFib uh, uh, when you go so far out. Uh, if, um, maybe you can say the unknown one because it was not uh, marked well is, is a continuous one. But most of them have a much lower burden than they had before. And stroke, freedom from stroke is, uh, is uh, quite, a, quite uh, impressive. And more importantly, 80% of our, 84% of our patients are off anticoagulation 24 months. This, this figure is being maintained, it's about 82 at five years, but 98% of the patients that are eligible to be off anticoagulation are off anticoagulation. This patient needs to get anticoagulation anyhow. They have other indications. Either they are hypercoagulable, you know, that thromboembolic events, and so on and so forth. Only two patients at, 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 uh, at two, one year, and only 1% of the patient at two, uh, five years are, are, are on anticoagulation. And this is a big, big, big discussion now, but I want to refer to another patient, a paper of ours, actually two of them that came one after the other, that showed that basically, uh, if we look at patients uh, over time, this is a kaplan meier curve, this is freedom from stroke, and this is freedom from bleeding. Okay, but more importantly, this is freedom from anticoagulation and this is freedom from stroke. You see there is no correlation when you stop the anticoagulation in patients after a maze procedure as opposed to uh, where the stroke happened. And this brought to a second uh, paper after this that one is the CHAT score is, is completely irrelevant when it comes to a full maze procedure and exclusion of the left arterial appendage. And the second one, a new, a new paradigm about you know, how to treat patients with anticoagulation. Quality of life improved, and, 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 and this is uh, really significant. Now, what do we do here for the uh, left arterial appendage? So we started by closing the appendage from the inside. At six months, I was unhappy because at 4.8% of the patient, we had some recommunication, although in the, in the operating room it was fine. So we started to introduce, and we published it in Innovation, uh, the epicardial a transfer sinus approach for the left arterial appendage, and we have done it in, I don't even know how many patients, and it looks extremely, extremely well. So the PRO, the PRO2 is actually amazing for it because it has this, there is no cage, and, and we are doing well there. Quality of life improved, and, and basically, um, I think that when we look at it now, we say, okay, this is what we have to aim to, and, and this is why we work so hard on those beating heart procedures to improve them, to make them equivalent to the results we have here. And we can, but we don't have the right technology yet. And I think we need to, to work on it. So Steve, I took too much time today. Let's have you.
All right, everybody, hang in there. One last talk to go. So I was asked to talk about uh, minimally invasive ablation for AFib and alternative lesion sets. And um, what we're going to try to do is uh, talk primarily about one uh, aspect. Niv is um, giving you a little bit of a harbinger into that, and that's a, an epicardial endocardial hybrid uh, ablation. We'll talk about it and its role in how we treat various forms of atrial fibrillation and perhaps some other uh, devices as well later on, and, and I certainly would have those discussions in the um, lab if you like. We'll talk, I think, importantly about the rationale for a hybrid ablation approach, and, uh, and then in the theme of re-evolution, uh, spend a little bit more time on things like patient selection, ask, access and exposure, how you get there, how you get out, like we talked about yesterday in the lab. Uh, some limitations about the surgical device technology is uh, Niv has talked to you about and, um, and a, a little bit about some of the results uh, early on in this hybrid approach. So from my standpoint, um, when I talk about this, uh, and I agree with Niv, I think that right now we're really concentrating on patients with persistent long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation as being the uh, patient population that we intend to deal with. For us, Paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, uh, given what uh, Michelle Hasegar has told us, is predominantly um, uh, from an ablation standpoint in the realm of the electrophysiologists um, who in large part can create uh, excellent pulmonary vein isolation and in those patients that fail medical therapy, catheter ablation is reasonable. Um, and we see very few of those patients, and I think appropriately so. But what we're really focusing on today is the patient with difficult atrial fibrillation, uh, complex lone atrial fibrillation. We're not going to talk about uh, concomitant ablation. We can talk about that in the lab if you want, but we're really talking today about is patients who have AFib and AFib alone. And um, uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about why we would consider um, a hybrid approach. So uh, because, you know, as Nib told you, one of the, uh, I think, challenges that Dr. Cox and Dr. Damiano and Dr. Ad have had over the years is that um, uh, they've shown you an extremely effective gold standard for the surgical treatment of atrial fibrillation, but it's just not taken off. Um, and so one of the questions I think that we have yet to answer um, is can we simplify this by making it less invasive, uh, as again is the theme of re-evolution, and, um, and perhaps uh, make a dent in some of that. So w one of the things that's uh, true is that we cannot perform a complete maze procedure off-pump thoracoscopically. I completely agree with that. Um, a complete maze procedure cannot be formed by catheter ablation alone. I completely agree with that. You can't make transmural lines with dots. Um, our EPs are excellent, though, at localizing and closing those gaps um, that um, occur in non-transmural um, failed surgical lesions. And they're excellent at creating, creating conduction block in narrow, confined areas, um, perhaps that we can't achieve surgically. Biatrial macro reentrant circuits maintain complex atrial fibrillation um, because the COX-3 lesion set works. Dr. Ad has just given you a, a, an excellent description of why that is true. So um, that, I believe, should be still be the basis of any um, uh, minimally invasive attempt epicardially to ablate AFib. Surgeon's tools are better are debulking these long lines of ablation than our EP colleagues, um, but their tools are probably better than ours at testing those lines to be sure that they're complete. Uh, so the use of both of these technologies, we believe, should allow us to interrupt all macro reentrant circuits that uh, perpetuate atrial fibrillation, reduce in invasiveness uh, without sacrificing results, and make the combined procedure safer and more um, appealing to our uh, referring physicians and our patients. Um, by doing this, what we're really talking about is a plan that uh, allows us to work with, not compete with, our electrophysiology colleagues for the benefit of patients. Um, and uh, I'll direct you to the other hybrid applications we've talked about, um, uh, you know, at this summit, uh, TAVR, hybrid coronary vascularization. Um, uh, we find those programs to be exceedingly effective. So what we're really talking about is, um, uh, let's just say we're talking about, the, as you've just seen, the um, documented left, left atrial macroentrant circuits that perpetuate non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. If we can have an anatomic way of ablating those, um, then it makes sense that we ought to have a highly efficacious procedure. So um, the procedure that we're talking about is one that creates uh, bilateral pulmonary vein isolation with a, um, a bipolar, bidirectional clamp that Dr. Ad talked with you about, using connecting lines, um, perhaps uh, less efficacious um, uh, products, but um, uh, given some 
tools that we've and, uh, and techniques that we've used, I think, um, become more um, efficacious to create um, the connecting lines that create that posterior left atrial um, uh, isolation. We ought to be able to remove a great many of those uh, uh, macro entrant circuits, align to the left atrial appendage, uh, helps some more, and then ligating left atrial appendage helps even more. Um, now, as part, as uh, Dr. Rad mentioned to you, as part of the original maze procedure, um, um, we placed uh, radio opaque clips um, in that area f uh, between the coronary sinus and the um, uh, posterior left atrial wall to help with further ablation, and that's what we do in uh, this uh, minimal invasive hybrid procedure as well. Um, so that the completed left-sided um, procedure looks something like this. So then our, uh, our uh, electrophysiology colleagues at a follow-up catheter ablation can come in now that uh, they can see both electrophysiologically with mapping and fluoroscopically with um, uh, these radiopaque clips can come in and create short lines of ablation um, to uh, uh, complete a uh, AV valve line lesion set that ought to take care of much of this um, atypical left atrial flutter that we'll uh, occasionally see after uh, this sort of a procedure. So who would we consider using this procedure for? Well, obviously we're talking about patients with low atrial fibrillation that are highly symptomatic and have failed medical therapy. They may have failed catheter ablation as well. And, um, it's particularly important, I think, that we are looking for patients who um, have poor results with other means of therapy, particularly those patients with significant AF burden. Uh, as I mentioned, those patients with persistent or long-standing persistent atrial fibrillation, and those patients with a large left atrium in whom uh, the disorganization, disorganization of their uh, macro entrance circuits is such that they cannot be managed in any other way. So the logistics of this procedure that I'm going to tell you about are, uh, it can be, it, we usually perform it in a hybrid operating room. It can be performed as a same-day procedure or as a staged procedure, and we do have experience with both of these, and I don't know that we'll have time to talk about it right um, during this session, but we, if you want to, we can talk about it in the uh, question and answer session. So we start, uh, obviously it's under general anesthesia with double luminated tracheal tube to allow us to um, uh, manage one lung than the other, and transophyllic cardiogram to, at least at the very beginning, assure that there's um, no thrombus and left atrial appendage, and then um, assure us that we have complete left atrial appendage ligation, which I think is critically important at the end of the procedure. We'll start on the right side to create the lines of ablation that I just told you about, pulmonary vein isolation and those connecting lines. Um, we'll move to the left side to finish the ablation, ligate the left atrial appendage, um, and um, then allow our EP colleagues to uh, perform endocardial testing and ablation as needed. Batteries might have finally worn out. There we go. Um, so what this allows us to do then, the surgical lesion set um, uh, ends up being um, a bilateral pulmonary vein isolation, superior inferior connecting lines, a left atrial appendage line, um, and a coronary sinus line. Right atrial lines can be done, and uh, we can talk about whether those are efficacious or not. We've had lots of discussions about that recently. Uh, we do baseline uh, EP testing epicardially and post-ablation epicardial testing as well. And if you believe in the ganglionated plexi and anatomic uh, denervation, that's also something that's possible with this technique as well. So then our EP colleagues come in, map the posterior left atrium, test and augment any lines that we have, conform, perform cafe mapping if they think that's an important thing, and then um, uh, proceed to the AV valve lines on the left and the right side to complete the lesion set. So this is a cardo map that basically shows um, we've done a pretty good job uh, except an incomplete area here in the um, uh, superior uh, connecting line. Um, and again, that's a very easy thing for them to uh, localize and touch up. Um, so this thoracoscopic ablation is performed all endoscopically, beating heart off pump, uh, using the radio frequency devices that you'll see in the lab today. Um, uh, and uh, uh, depending on how you use these devices, we believe uh, what we'll, we'll show you in a little bit, that it creates really very effective lines um, uh, for um, uh, ablating a AFib. We're going to talk just a little bit uh, now about some of the kind of logistics of this, and I'll mention some of these things um, uh, briefly, but we'll talk about patient preparation, positioning, port site selection, pericardial incisions, retraction sutures, dissection, and retraction. This is all the things that we'll go through in the lab this afternoon. So I'll try to move through this as quickly as we can. 
positioning patients, it's a little bit like we talked about yesterday with the thoracotomy. You can elevate the chest either on sheets or with an inflatable bladder. Um, uh, I use the inflatable bladder because we started doing this at, at the same day procedure. We can inflate the chest, as you'll see in a picture in just a minute. When we're done, we deflate them, and our EP colleagues are ready to uh, roll with their procedure. So uh, this is what the patient looks like either uh, up on blankets or in our patients with these uh, Rojo um, bladders to allow us access to the um, side of the chest for um, uh, port access. We use, I use three working ports. Um, some of my colleagues have used a fourth port for retraction. Um, and like many of the concepts as we've talked, we've talked about in the last two days, a wider array allows a little bit more working room and less um, um, uh, bumping of the uh, devices. From a port access standpoint, or we'll show you the array in the lab, um, but basically, uh, and this is what it looks like surgically, um, uh, we've used a combination of five or ten millimeter ports, or uh, scopes I mean, um, the five millimeter scope, or port incisions are certainly more cosmetic, but the five millimeter scopes tend to be a little bit fragile and uh, depending on uh, how much um, uh, force you're putting on them, uh, both will create the same uh, uh, view for you. So we start with the five millimeter port in the mid-axillary line uh, and then move to 10 millimeter ports um, through the rest. And so we end up with three 10 millimeter ports. I, have, I know people that do this with three fives. Uh, we start uh, as we saw there. Um, and then um, once we've achieved port access, we'll uh, open the pericardium and begin to section. Um, for this procedure, it's all about the phrenic nerve. We talked a little bit about this yesterday and um, making an incision safely around the phrenic nerve when we're talking about right-sided uh, mitral valve access. Here we're talking about bilateral um, uh, pericardial access. And if you um, uh, injure one phrenic nerve, um, the patient is going to be a little bit short of breath and may not run a four-minute mile again. If you injure both phrenic nerves, you might not get them off the ventilator. So it becomes really a very important thing. Um, we dissect away the epicardial fat that often actually um, ends up with an envelope of the phrenic nerve, and then uh, you can open the pericardium with a scissors, bovi, harmonic, whatever you tend to use. Um, uh, and again, you have to be careful about the anatomic course of the phrenic nerve as you're opening this up. Um, retraction sutures are important. We'll show you those today. Um, it, it can, this procedure can probably be done on the right side without them. On the left side, it is absolutely crucial uh, to be able to see everything that you need to um, uh, ablate and safely ligate the appendage. Um, the oblique and transverse sinuses get uh, uh, then dissected to allow you access to the pulmonary veins, and again, we'll show you this in the lab. Um, basically, um, blunt dissection around the um, uh, oblique sinus and the transverse sinus is um, what you do on a regular basis transternally, but um, it is a little bit different when you're looking at it through scopes from the side. Uh, and then we'll use um, a lighter dissector, uh, dissector that uh, helps us uh, safely maneuver around the pulmonary veins that Randy Wolf developed uh, at the very beginning of this pro uh, procedure years ago, which I still um, think is a very useful adjunct for safely manipulating around the um, pulmonary veins. Um, and we'll use that uh, bipolar bidirectional clamp that Dr. Ad showed you, uh, which I think is a superior device um, to make an ablation line on the antrum of left atrium, both on the right side and the left side. Um, uh, I use this particular um, unidirectional um, uh, uh, bipolar device um, to uh, create those uh, connecting lines. We can talk about that in the lab as well. We'll go to the left side and do the same thing. Uh, again, uh, encircle the veins, clamp the veins, finish our um, epicardial lines, and then ligate the appendage. Now I think that uh, I'm going to stop for just a second and talk just a little bit about this. I agree with Dr. Ad. The, one of the things that has been shown repeatedly in studies um, of uh, the cut and sew and Cox 4 lesion set is that stroke prevention is dramatic. Um, and that Dr. Cox thinks that that may, well, it's, it's certainly uh, been helped by um, getting rid of AFib. He thinks it may be solely due to making sure that the appendage is completely um, uh, removed from the uh, blood pool. Um, so uh, what we don't really know is in an isolated setting if that's absolutely the case, but we think that that's potentially a, uh, an advantage of surgical ablation. And while hundreds of patients may be getting done surgically and tens of thousands are getting done in a catheter-based way, um, I think one of our goals is to try to um, uh, prove that this is a 
procedurally important and really critical part of surgical ablation for atrial fibrillation and um, a potential advantage for surgery. So we use this particular device. There are several on the market. Uh, applied epicardially, not in the circulating blood flu, compresses the tissue and actually um, helps not only um, to r remove the um, uh, uh, the appendage from the blood pool mechanically, but also is important in the electrophysiologic aspects of the maze procedure as well. Um, that's part of the maze procedure is removing some of the um, uh, uh, rare but, uh, but uh, documented uh, places for left atrial appendage flutters and that sort of thing. Um, so that's, that is a part of the lesion set. Um, I'm going to skip through the videos and that sort of thing just for time. So this is what the final lesion set looks like. Um, bilateral pulmonary vein isolation, co connecting lines, um, uh, line to left atrial appendage, right, right side of lines if you need, and these little dots here are our EP colleagues finishing things up and, um, and performing a left-sided and right-sided AV valve lines. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've talked about, you know, is that, and we'll talk about it at the end, is that we believe that while this is an amaze procedure, um, this is um, uh, consistent with maze principles. So how have we done? Uh, well, this is just a little compilation of some of the, uh, the um, papers that I think have been written in the last uh, five years or so about um, uh, results from uh, thoracoscopic ablation. And I think generally you'll see that these are numbers that, depending on your monitoring strategy and that sort of thing, are, are comparable um, to a lot of the data that's come out about, um, you know, uh, open maze procedures. Now, admittedly, these are all really small single center studies, and I think that's just got one of the uh, limitations of this procedure to this point is um, uh, to uh, get this in the hands of more folks and, um, and get the word out there for, to be able to operate on more patients. Um, this is a paper that we presented at the STS a couple of years ago looking at um, a consecutive group of our patients that had continuous monitoring. And, um, and Dr. Rad and I have talked about this before. So one of the questions is how carefully do you look at patients and, and the success rate of these? So these were patients that either if they didn't have permanent pacemakers in, we put internal loop recorders in to allow us continuous monitoring of these patients. And um, fortunately, we were able to show that the procedure itself is relatively safe. But I think the most important thing is what we showed is that a follow-up of almost a year that uh, a significant majority of those patients were in sinus rhythm um, and that 76% uh, of those patients were in sinus rhythm off antiarrhythmics, which again is, I think, comparable to a lot of the data that you've heard uh, about the maze procedure. So limitations of this procedure, there certainly are several. Um, we certainly, as I mentioned, uh, need larger, better controlled studies of this sort of a technique. Uh, we need standardization of lesion sets, I believe, because everybody's got sort of a modification and that makes it really difficult to study this scientifically. We need to determine the optimal timing of a surgery and catheterization. What we tended to see in our patients that we did this on a uh, one-stop shopping basis is there's enough edema during the surgical procedure that when the electrophysiologists um, uh, mapped the uh, the pushed the left atrial wall, they thought we did a pretty good job. But I think a lot of that was edema, then went away and those lesions reconnected and about 20% of patients, they had to come back for a repeat catheterization. And so we tend to now recommend um, a staged procedure, let the surgery heal and then come back for a, a follow-up electrophysiologic procedure. We need to improve the operative timings, uh, time uh, by streamlining these techniques and as I said, put this in the hands of more surgeons. So for me then, the way that we look at this from a, for complex symptomatic lone atrial fibrillation, um, if you have non-paroxysmal atrial fibrillation and you're a candidate for a thoracoscopic hybrid ablation, that's typically where we'll go. And as Dr. Ad mentioned, a lot of times, depending on your relationship with your electrophysiologist, that'll happen now before they get catheter ablation. Um, if you're not a candidate for thoracoscopic ablation, we'll either go down the road of uh, minimally invasive Cox Mace 4 or uh, you know, other types of um, uh, perhaps less rigorous lesion sets um, uh, that can be performed epicardially. Um, and if not, then basically your options are catheter-based or uh, uh, medical. And in summary, then, I'll, I'll say that thoracoscopic hybrid ablation is not the next generation of the Cox Maze procedure, but I believe it is based on all the principles that make the Cox Maze 3 4 um, successful. Um, uh, and that is um, uh, making sure that you electrically isolate the pulmonary veins, uh, interrupt to most, if not all, of the macro entrance circuits known to perpetuate atrial fibrillation, ablate ganglionated plexi if you believe that's an important part of initiation and perpetuation of atrial fibrillation. 
um, locate and manage um, cafes um, and the ligament of Marshall, rigorously test all ablation lines and manage the left atrial appendage. Um, we believe it's been shown, uh, at least in early uh, experience, to be safe and effective for treating complex refractory AFib, um, uh, that it tends to reduce the patient impact and can be more appealing to patients and referring physicians. And again, these types of hybrid therapies build relationships, referral patterns, and programs. Finally, I'll leave you with one last sort of summary slide, and this is, um, uh, this is, um, came from an article that Dr. Cox authored several years ago. Um, where he said, uh, what we're looking for here is an ideal minimally invasive ablation procedure that would be, um, you know, begin to approach the um, uh, efficacy of the maze 3 4. And what, and what we're looking for is something that's epicardial beating heart. Uh, we have an energy source that reliably ablates transmurally. We can treat paroxysmal AFib, long staying persistent AFib, and a flutter. We avoid coronary hormone bypass, is endoscopic, takes an hour, and in the absence of complications, the patients go home the next day. I would say we have not quite achieved that, but we're working in that direction. Um, so finally, uh, I would just say thank you very much. And I always show this slide to make sure that these two guys get thanked. This is Jimmy Edgerton, who taught me how to do this procedure, and obviously Dr. Cox, who taught most of the rest of us what we know about AFib. So thank you very much. We start from the bottom. Okay, so I, I think I think that's an excellent question. What is uh, what is the anticoagulation strategy um, post maze procedure? And um, let's start, Steve. What's yours for standalone? So it's a great question, and the answer is it depends. Um, all politics are local, and to be honest with you, it depends on uh, I think the. Um, uh, the education that you have provided your internists and electrophysiologists with regard to um, uh, stroke risk post maze and with a ligated left atrial appendage. My typical strategy is um, uh, I keep patients on anticoagulation and antiarrhythmics for at least the blanking period, so 90 days. And they'll look at me like, well, I just had this big procedure for AFib. Why do I got to be back on medicines? And it's a really a matter of education about the fact that it's the scar that we create from ablation and not the ablation procedure itself that, you know, uh, uh, ablates these lines. So at the end of the blanking period, if those patients are uh, no longer appear to have an AFib burden, then I'll stop their antiarrhythmics and leave them on anticoagulation for a period of time, depending on what antiarrhythmic they're washing out. They're washing out amio, that may take two or three months, depending on how big they are. Um, if you know, they're on a drug that's shorter acting, then it may be a month. And if I can monitor them rigorously and show that they have no AFib burden um, uh, off uh, antiarrhythmics for a period of time, I believe that's the point uh, that they can have their anticoagulation discontinued. So that's the protocol we've used. Sam? Um, actually, that's my question. I wrote it um, prompted by my PA, <laughs> McKinsey. <laughs> um, okay. I wanted to bring up the fact that uh, we've been doing some of these, uh, what, what the EPs call single shot um, ablations, the, the uh, simultaneous hybrids. And I'm very intrigued by the fact that they are extremely religious about anticoagulation because they form char and clot inside. And they actually, um, if it were, if, if, if I left it to them, they would start heparin the night of surgery. And I don't know of any um, surgeon who does that for, for a lone AFib procedure because they're very worried about the the endocardial uh, ablation lesions. So we, in the same day hybrids that we did, we did that for everybody, mm -hmm. which yeah. is, um, it, it is a difficult thing to get a surgeon to antiquate their, anticoagulate their patient in the night of surgery. And, but uh, you're right, that if you watch what they do, I'd be scared too. <laughs> about right. But we do, I mean, we do in endocardial ablations with, I guess we're using cryo, but in the days when we were using radiofrequency, uh, we, it was also an endocardial lesion. We were creating the substrate for potential clot formation. Yet, I don't think any of us really thought too hard about putting somebody on heparin after you'd opened their chest or done surgery on them. Yeah, so, so I, think, I think this is a, <clears throat> an extremely important question uh, for various reasons uh, and also a guidelines challenged question because there are no guidelines that we can come with to, to guide us. So, 
I can echo uh, what uh, Steve said and what uh, uh, Sam said, but I would add a, a couple of more points that guide me in the decision how to stop uh, or when to stop anticoagulation. So we anticoagulate all patients regarding the energy source um, probably up to about six months because if you stop the antiarrhythmic drugs at three months, I want to allow uh, you know at least six weeks off of it, and as you know, in clinic, it's not always like a computer, so six weeks, three months become four months sometimes, and so on and so forth. So six months, we are calling all the patients for halter, and if they are fine, they are candidates to stop anticoagulation, regardless the the chart score. However, we are very religious about the echo. So there are a few points with the echo that are important. One is how complete uh, and sustainable is the left atrial appendage exclusion or uh, uh, whatever you excised. Certainly, what's the, what's the quality of the flow within the left atrium? If you have echogenic flow, meaning, you know, in patients with low EF, severe diastolic dysfunction, and uh, sometimes even uh, maybe extreme LA dysfunction, then I would never stop Coumadin. There is a paper in Jack in 2012 that actually showed 50% stroke rate when they ignored the echogenicity uh, of the, uh, the smoke and, and, and in patients with predominantly were rheumatic heart disease patients. So I think if the echo is okay and the patient is in sinus rhythm, it's okay to stop anticoagulation. Uh, or at least we need to have a new paradigm outside the, the chart score. Because as, as you saw with, with our papers, uh, with two studies, there's more risk of bleeding than risk of uh, stroke uh, following that. So uh, I would urge every, everyone to have echo uh, as a part of your decision. So, uh, well, that's a little outside the, the talks, but when should concomitant ablation be done? Um, do you want me to, two minutes about the guidelines? Okay, well, so what the guidelines, the STSA, ATS guidelines showed is basically for the first time we showed level A, class one, that ablation procedure concomitantly improves 30 days outcome. Survival is higher. Second, no increase of complication. Those are the ATS guidelines. The STS guidelines have level A, a class one indication for mitral valve, and 2A for aortic and the cabbage. And also the type of procedure, they said, you know, if it's a moderate or severe MR, for instance, persistent or oxygen persistent, should be a maze procedure and a uniateral lesion set. So with that being said, the vast majority of patients should be ablated. But the problem is that this is not the reality. The reality is about 45% in the US, 60-some uh, percent for mitals, and 30 or less for cabbage and AVRs. So if we step outside the guidelines and, and look at, uh, at each one of us and say, what makes you to decide to do it or not, I think it's, it's your decision. I mean, I'm not going, you know, it's based on your experience and, and so on and so forth. So my own perspective, the patient I'm I'm worried about is are those with RV dysfunction, other comorbidities that you don't want to extend surgery, even not in a minute, and patients that you definitely know that uh, ablating AF is not going to help them in terms of quality of life and, and uh, longevity. So with that being said, what we also have in the guidelines, the SCS guidelines, we say that basically if you decide not to do the ablation, the least you should do is exclude the left atrial appendage. Which, which, what I don't understand is how, how some surgeons go into an AF case, they decide not to do an ablation, which is fine. I said it's legitimate as long as you base it on your own experience. You want to be safe, but you leave the appendage alone. That should not happen. I think, I think the question should be, uh, <clears throat> when should a concomitant ablation not be done? I think that, that should be the list of, of, of non-indications. For example, uh, how, what's the size of a left atrium and a right atrium for that matter that you would stay away from? And I know you have an opinion about that because you've published. And the second one is how many episodes of paroxysmal pre-op would you accept the patient, for example, that goes into AFib in the holding area and that's their first time? 
Is that somebody you would ablate? Would you take the appendage? Those kinds of questions sometimes pop up that people don't know the answer to. Well, I can answer. So I think any given size of left atrio is, um, if you do something right versus not, you're going to have some success. And we published a paper, uh, it's a well-quoted paper, that showed that even with 8.5 centimeter left atrium, you have success at about 60% at uh, five years. So that's better than zero. But the reality is that we almost never see those atria anymore because patients are being referred earlier. So I think it's becoming more and more of a theoretical question. As what to do with a patient with paroxysmal first time in the holding area, that's an excellent question because how do you know it's the first time? You don't know, so... First time documented. Yeah, so it, it's, 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 it's a big issue because, um, because you have to do, you have to remember the guidelines say that you have to treat only symptomatic AF. A symptomatic not necessarily have to be palpitation, you know, shortness of breath, strokes, etc., etc. but that's, that's the issue. But I, the least I would do with a patient, I would not do a maze procedure probably on this patient, and, but I would exclude the left outer appendage. I agree. Can we uh, take on the top question there for Steve, because you, you've done this several places? <laughs> yeah, so that's a hard one. Um, my EPs uh, just don't believe the data, and they don't think there's a role for surgery, maybe even in catheter ablation for AFib. What do you do about it? Um, uh, we have um, done a lot of different things. We've come, we've gone to places, and I've actually gone to places with my EPs and given talks and presented data and that sort of thing. And sometimes that helps, but most of the time it doesn't. I, I believe that there's a certain for whatever reason, there's a certain resistance um, that you may not be able to co overcome. I think that ultimately, the best thing that we can do is to con continue to generate good data to um, show that scientifically, this is uh, something that, um, you know, AFib is a dangerous mortal disease. People die from it and it complicates um, cardiac pathology across the board and that we have a procedure for it that is uh, maybe not 100% effective, but generally extremely effective um, if used appropriately. Um, and that, you know, once intervened on, um, the patients um, uh, have a reduced morbidity mortality down the line. So it's on us to generate the data that's going to make that um, uh, easy, easier to answer for surgeons trying to develop programs and that sort of thing. And I think things like taking that data and putting it into guidelines, as Dr. Ad has done and that sort of thing, is an, uh, an important step. So uh, I think that's probably the best way that you're going to do it, is just to ultimately come up with enough data to, um, to overcome that resistance. Yeah, I, I think I agree with everything was said. But uh, um, let me, I think I could give you a couple of advice that I, I think are important. One. If you will focus on the technical aspects of the procedure, that you can do it with a one hole, two holes, three holes, four holes, mid-sternotomy, whatever, you're going to fail 100% of the time. Because, as I always say, you know, the, the, the EPs have a different definition for a double-blind study. For them, a double-blind study is two cardiac, cardiac surgeons looking at EKG, you know. So, so you have to understand that. They think we are morons when it comes to AFib. And most of the time, they are right. Most of the time, they are right. So the first thing you have to do is to convince them that you are not there just for the case and the RVU is basically you want to establish serious. And that's a process, and it takes time, and, and it takes some, some, you know, some, some, some uh, you know, dedication. The second thing, Everybody is going after the standalone, but the low hanging fruit is the concomitant. So often I go to places and the EP is saying to me, Yeah, he wants me to start to send him patients, but you know, he gets 100 mitral a year with, with, with AFib and he does zero. So why should I send standalone? So start to develop those relationships around the patients you already have that they are coming to surgery and do a good job there and communicate with your EPs. You know, you call the EPs for the to the operating room when you do a bilateral pulmonary vein isolation part of the maze with a clamp, and you ask them to help you to assess the block. So you introduce them into the surgical arena, which they are completely blinded to, 
as a process. And so you have the, the EPs in the operating room, one time after the other, helping you to assess exit block, whatever in the post of care and so on and so forth. And I think this way you can create some type of uh, common grounds and you can, you, can, you can talk with them about it. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Can I just add as well that um, the majority of EPs that I meet and I, and I talk to, they are very, very interested to talk to a surgeon who has knowledge about atrial fibrillation. And they're very intrigued and excited and surprised when they find such a person. And they also like to hear the word minimally invasive. And when you say that you can partner with them minimally invasively, not only on their AFibs, but also on their VTAC and on their lead extractions and on anything and everything they do, uh, you become a really, really good friend and a resource. And uh, you'll be in their hybrid rooms more frequently than, than, uh, than maybe you would like to be. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and I think the relationship is, is much, much deeper than just, uh, than just AFib with, with EP. I have two questions, uh, and they're sort of related. Dr. Cox has said that uh, recurrences of AFib in the initial postoperative period are common, and that's been part of my experience. So one, what is your strategy for antiarrhythmic drugs after the maze? And then two, there appear to be some patients um, who benefit from some long-term substrate modification by continuing on some homeopathic dose of drugs. Do you have any feel for who those people are, how you identify them preoperatively? Yeah, th those are two excellent questions. Uh, you want to? Go ahead, sir. Yeah. Um, so post-procedure uh, antiarrhythmic therapy, uh, I usually try to have them on a uh, class one or class three drug. A lot of them, if I'm lucky, they'll come in on a beta blocker. Uh, amiodarone is my drug of choice. Um, uh, there's a lot of resistance um, that I see um, in various places to, um, to real antiarrhythmic therapy, real class three drugs. Um, uh, but I think if the goal is to have them on them short term, you very rarely see the long term side effects that people are worried about. Um, uh, but uh, short of uh, amio, I've used Sodalol not uncommonly for its pharmacologic or the, the, the pharmacologic benefits of it, um, uh, and you know to a lesser extent uh, uh, Fleck or something else. Um, uh, so um, that, that's what I would use on a short-term basis. Um, uh, do you have a different? Well, I generally will start them back on the medic medications they that wrong? they came in on. Yeah, so, so we have a prospective on my study on that that we published, uh, I think presented AATS the year before the last, uh, showing that MEO um, for uh, three months is a benefit, you know, it's a, it's a huge benefit, much less recurrences. We are not that smart, it's based on some of the EP literature that show the same. So the more, the more you have the patients on antiretinic drugs, regardless of the rhythm at discharge, it's, it's better and less events. But it brings uh, your second question, it actually is it's a fascinating question to me. And we have a paper that's right now under review in uh, Jack that I think we are uh, touching uh, that point. And the issue is how important it is, exactly what you said, to modify the remodeling. Maybe we don't know much about reverse remodeling. We don't know what happened if we bring back the patient to sinusoidum and what happens on the molecular level as much as we want to know. But Conceptually, if you keep them, if we say atrial fibrillation begets atrial fibrillation, we may say that sinus rhythm begets sinus rhythm. So now, because of the guidelines and, and, and the way they press us that the success is only off medication, sometimes we are being forced to stop the medication every time just to say, oh, six months we have 100% off medication. This is why I think it's a little artificial. So we look at the problem in a different way, and I'll get to the point very quickly because the time is short. If you have a stable sinus rhythm during the first year, okay, meaning that every time point or long, long, longitudinal follow-up with the reveal or whatever methods you use, okay, that's the ultimate predictor for five-year success rate. Stable sinus rhythm at five years. The paper was presented at the AATS last year, and uh, now it's under consideration for Jack. This is with 800 patients. That's not with 20 patients. 
So often, if the patient had a six centimeter atrium, they had continuous atrial fibrillation, they are doing extremely well, I would not stop the antiarrhythmic drugs for, let's say, six to nine months. But unfortunately, I don't have exact, you know, cutting point and decision making, but it, it makes a lot of sense. This is a fascinating question in my mind. So, well, just, just yeah. one cool last question, so on the, about the conversion, who asked it? <laughs> huh? no, no. Nobody's yeah. owning up. So, so let, let me What's tell you. What's the answer yeah, to well, the question? Well, the guidelines would say no, but it doesn't mean that this is specific opinion about conversion. It's about hybrid, it's about that's being done with uni, unidirectional uh, technology and it's about any any of these. That's what the guidelines are saying. Now it's based on some evidence, but uh, you know it, the guidelines are guidelines. It's not something we should uh, live and die by. But the one thing we have to remember that I was I'm always amazed by that. That imagine that we were starting to treat mitral valve today. And the companies will come to you and say to you, the ultimate study to test if mitral valve repair is working minimally invasively is mitral clip. This is where we are in the world of atrial fibrillation. Instead of showing that mitral valve repair using the Carpentier technique is working well, and then you move to, to cords, and then you move to this, to, to compare to other avenues, we started with a mitral clip and now we may have to go all the way back because convergent, some reports are dismal when it comes to success, but very importantly, there is one report in the literature from this state with a very known electrophysiology, Andrea Natale, showing 12.3% mortality. I don't have 12.3% mortality on anything I do, let alone AFib. So we have to be very, very, very careful. So anything you do, you need to have control you need to have the uh, right delivery of endpoints so, so we can move this, this field forward so we can, we, can, um, uh, we can achieve what Steve predicts, and I think and rightfully so, that we can, we can achieve the goal of, of beating heart, minimally invasive procedure sooner than later. But we need to be very, very careful about the steps. You know, the only thing that I'll add to that, I t totally agree with that, uh, is that the difficulty with convergent is that um, it is simple. Uh, and it, I, you know, in my opinion, the lesion set isn't as rigorous. Um, the inability to manage left atrial appendage is not present, although a great many surgeons that I know, um, including myself, who have done this conversion procedure are now adding a uh, um, three scope uh, left sided um, uh, thoracoscopic left atrial appendage ligation to convergent. Um, so that's, you know, potentially an improvement. And I, again, I think it depends on who you're talking about um, using con conversion procedure for. If you're talking about treating um, uh, patients who have paroxysmal AFib and have failed a catheter ablation, that may not be an unreasonable thing, that are kind of verging toward persistent. But um, uh, I think it's, uh, it, it may be one, of, uh, one more uh, arrow in our quiver um, but I think it's very early, early on in the experience, and I think we'll just have to sort of see where it goes. Yeah, and, and just before, I know we need to finish, but, um, you know, Dr. Cox was uh, quoted about the future of beating out surgery and uh, the excellent, uh, what's an, an excellent procedure, but he always says often, which I agree, if you take Whipple procedure for pancreatic cancer and you look at the results of esophageal cancer for a different procedure, when you look at the results at one year, they look pretty good, but if you look at five years, they're all dead. So, um, Le Maire just presented in Europe his results with hybrid procedure, he's the most experienced one, five year results. So his, his, his sinus rhythm rate is about 70 some percent, but if you look by the definition, it's less than 50 percent. So, um, we are going to be scrutinized about cost, about outcomes, and the biggest risk of this hybrid procedure is that it's not going to be shown more effective than multiple catheter ablation procedure. It's not that it's less good than what I showed. It's obvious that the maze procedure is better, but we have an obstacle, a psychological obstacle to send patients to this procedure, which is understood. 
It's that if hybrid procedure, beating heart procedure, are not going to be shown more effective than catheter ablation in five years, this entire field is dead. Well, on that note, I think we're going to uh, <laughs> finish the session. Uh, a gloomy note, you might think, but that's not the case because when you go upstairs, I think you will, you will learn uh, what, what they have to say. And uh, so my thanks to Niv, uh, Steve, uh, Ralph, Damiano, in absence, uh, wherever he is, uh, still on this earth. I, I, I didn't mean for it to come across that way, uh, but uh, in Atlanta or back home. And of course, Sam for helping with the discussion. Now, um, before we go up, so... Okay, now, um, the next thing is, you'll be going up for the lab. There are four rotations that you will have today. One of those will be atrial fibrillation. Um, the others uh, will be mixed cabbage. The third will be robotic cabbage. And the fourth is something that uh, uh, is sort of a combination of what Teresa Kiza spoke of, which is graft assessment, showing the technical details of how to perform it, the, the, uh, the, the physics behind it, the rationale and how to interpret it. And that will be in combination with another section to that rotation, which will be in the hybrid room. We have a full hybrid room up over there, where you'll be taught um, you know, how to operate a hybrid room. And uh, there's a cadaver on there. You'll be shown how to do a lung nodule localization as a way to demonstrate the use of the hybrid room for a surgeon. So those are four very interesting rotations. Some of them, for example, the atrial fibrillation and the robotic cabbage station will have more than one faculty. So I would ask you when you go to those stations that you split yourself up and then halfway through, switch over. That way you get the experience and it's not that everybody goes to one, one faculty member um, and, and the other one isn't doing anything. Uh, and just as you had yesterday, when you go upstairs, you will have uh, detailed instructions on, on what to do. We're running a little bit behind, but that doesn't matter. We'll take another you know, 20, 30 minutes for lunch and getting changed. Even if we get started by 1.30, we will easily finish by 5.15, 5.30, which is what, uh, which is what we have, uh, we have uh, allowed for. The faculty, I would ask you to please go upstairs and inspect your stations at the earliest opportunity while the attendees are changing. All of you, please fill out your online evaluations. You have no idea how important this is to us because we really use it as a guide to help uh, alter and change what we do for you in the future. Uh, uh, I'd like to thank all of the faculty since this is the last opportunity I'll have to, or any of us will have to address uh, uh, us as a group. Uh, thank the residents in particular. I was very, very pleased that we had about 15 residents this year and reiterate what Dr. McGillivray said about our thanks to Gore for providing the support uh, to bring them in and we hope this will continue year after year. Thank, of course, all of the attendees over here, but most importantly, close to my heart, to thank the staff who made this possible. Uh, Carrie Stein, the AV crew that we've talked about, Brandy and Angie up in the lab, Rose, who's my, uh, who's my assistant, who's just given countless hours to this. So I'd like you to give them all a big round of applause, please. Okay, let's get some food and then we'll go upstairs and uh, get changed.